Uh, tonight, we want to talk about 10 things to do to make Ramadan beneficial. Now, one of the unfortunate things that happens is that when Ramadan comes, the, the average Muslim, uh, the way they connect and relate to Ramadan uh, is of such a nature that they actually only reap 5 or 10% of the benefit, that the potential benefit that is there in Ramadan. And this is an unfortunate thing because Ramadan represents one of the single greatest opportunity that you have to be able to become something special in the eyes of Allah and to make your affairs right. So Ramadan has three things which it comes with. Number one, it comes as a test, a kind of an audit to let, to let us know where are you at. In other words, Ramadan come and say fast. And now you have to ask yourself, is my faith strong enough that I will fast this Ramadan? So it comes as a way of self-auditing yourself based on how you reacted and all that it is asking from you. It becomes now a way that you can gauge how, how strong is my faith, you know, in relation to Ramadan. So Ramadan comes and it exposes the weak, it separates the weak believers from the strong ones. You see a lot of the weak believers, they may make excuses and all of that. So it is a test in the sense of trying to help you to, to get a gauge of how strong your faith is. Secondly, Ramadan is also an opportunity to fix our past relationship and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a chance to fix and rectify all that we may have done in sins and all of that during the year and the past years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us this month allows us to, to, to come to be able to settle our account with Allah and to become good with him again. So Ramadan allows us this amazing opportunity to fix all of our affairs and get it right. So the first one is the present test. The second one is fixing your past. And then in terms of the future, Ramadan also is a program that Allah has designed to train us and help us to become this incredible believer, a person of taqwa, so that going forward, we begin to live a new kind of life. And so Ramadan comes and it gives you something to focus on your present, your past, and your future. So it is really one of the greatest opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for the believers. So all of us should feel grateful and excited to be able to meet this wonderful visitor that comes for a very short time once a year. So tonight we want to explore some things that we can do that will increase the benefit that we may get from this month instead of just doing what we used to do. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. And in this month, Allah has asked us to fast. Whoever witnesses the month, Allah says they must observe the fast. And so fasting is keeping away from food, drink, and re intimate relations with your spouse during the daylight hours from dawn to sunset, from su sunrise to sunset. A lot of times what happens is that when Ramadan comes, our Muslim community, we immediately go into the mode of what we have to do and how we have to do it. We spend a lot of time focusing on the how and the what. And very rarely do we question the why. But really the most important question we need to ask is why? In other words, why do I have to fast? Why do I have to do the things that Allah is? Because if you don't understand the why, and we spend a lot of time on the what and the how, you know, a lot of questions you get from people, how do I fast? What breaks the fast? You know, um, if I do this, if I brush my teeth, does it break the fast? These are all good. But then we lose the essence. Why are you going to go through standing up every night to pray tarawih? Why are we going to be fasting? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prescribing fasting for us immediately tells us the why. He says, Ya ayyuhalladzina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladzina min kablikum la'allakum tattakoon. O you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed to those before you 
in order that you may acquire taqwa. And they use the word la'alla, that um, la'allakum tattaqoon. Not that you will definitely get taqwa if you fast, that there is a possibility, there's a chance, there's an opportunity to acquire taqwa if you begin to fast. And so we must keep this in mind that the whole purpose of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing this fasting to us, this month to us, is to help us to become a kind of person whose standard is taqwa. And we have explained in numerous classes what taqwa is. It is the ability or the discipline or the faith that you will need to keep away from the prohibitions of Allah. That Allah has prohibited certain things and you have the, the enough iman to be able to move yourself to keep away from those things. And if you keep away from those things, then you obviously you will be doing the things which please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So taqwa is really an important concept. Now, to acquire taqwa, we require two things. And this is the essence of what you're going to be doing in the Ramadan. First, you have to have your in intention. I am fasting because Allah has commanded us to fast. That's a very important understanding. The reason why we fast is because Allah said fast during this month. So you need to make the intention for fasting. Then we need to do two important things all through the month. Because sometimes we get lost in the shuffle. Why, why are we doing all of this? So I want you to remember these two things. This is in essence what you're doing for the whole month. I'm connecting and I'm changing. These are the two key words you want to grab onto. If you remember nothing else tonight, I want you to remember these two words. Ramadan is here to help us to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to change ourselves according to the dictates of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ramadan is a month in which it's a training program in which Allah allows you to connect to him and then to be able to move us, our behavior, our habits, everything from one point to another point, from a place of weakness to a place of strength, to become a person who may not be so critical and understanding taqwa to one who truly observes their relationship with Allah. So at the end of Ramadan, no one should be the same place where they started Ramadan. The shayateen or the devils that gets locked up in Ramadan, when they come back after Ramadan and the Eid, they must not recognize you. They must say, wow, I left one person before Ramadan and now I'm come back and this is a completely different person. All the bad habits that they used to have, where is it? They have changed. And so you wanna have Ramadan be a place that is gonna change you. So your Allah is extending his connection to you making sure you get 5G and 6G and set all the connections that you will need in Ramadan to help you to change, Allah is extending all of that for you. Magnifying the deeds that you do, coming in the third of the night, Allah is doing everything that he can and we will see some of the details of that, that he is reaching out in an extraordinary way to help us to connect and to change ourselves. So once you understand these two things, then the way you will conduct yourself in Ramadan will be with the idea that I'm changing. It's not just doing the same thing over and over. There are so many people, you know, they, they used to smoke cigarette before Ramadan, they stopped for the month, and then they return back to the same habits. So what has Ramadan accomplished for you if it doesn't change anything in our lives? So Ramadan is supposed to change things in our lives. And if you Keep that concept as you enter Ramadan, then that will be very important to take you through there. And so tonight we want to share with you 10 things that if you try to at least do them in some small way, it will magnify the benefits you will get in Ramadan. What is the benefits? Changing you to become a person of taqwa. So let us explore 10 of these things and see uh, first knowing about them and then be able to prepare. So, in order to benefit the most from Ramadan, there are two things that we must try to free up a lot of. One, 
we must try to have a lot of time available for us. So, because you want to spend your time in Ramadan really connecting, really worshiping, really obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really working on yourself. So as much time as you could get available for that, that is of essence of how much you're going to benefit. But if you are just as busy as you are in your normal routine in Ramadan, then you won't have enough time to really do a lot of the things. So prior to Ramadan, we have to begin the process of let me see what time I can free up. It's like when you go on vacation, we have to work on freeing up time to be available for that vacation. We have to make arrangements with our job. Look, we're not coming in for two weeks. You know, we have to make arrangements with all kinds of things. We tell the lawn mowing guy, don't come for the next two weeks. We tell the doctor, we're not coming for, you know, we're making all arrangements to be as available for our vacation as possible. Same way in Ramadan, you're gonna free up as much as you can to be available for being there for Ramadan to be able to focus. So on our jobs, for some of us who have regular nine to five job, you begin to ask your boss, I don't eat lunch during Ramadan. So can I get that time in the afternoon? Can I leave early? So I now have an extra hour that I can use towards Ramadan. Ask for time off for Jumwa if you can get it. Avoid any overtime work. This is not the month you want to spend doing overtime work at your job. So you want to be able to forego that reschedule any major projects so you want to be a free you don't want to be so involved in projects in other words you're striving to find how you can free up as much time as possible if you could get some days off of vacation so you could be at home you can be able to focus on ramadan so that's the first thing we have to free up time and negotiate with our jobs now is the time to do that it's a little bit too late now actually and then at home we have to make sure that we have time available. Make sure your car is not going to be an issue. So you have to fix those now. You have to make sure if you have leaking roof and big major chores to do, fixing appliances and all of that, make sure those things are done now. It's because when you go into Ramadan, we don't want to be spending our time doing that. Shop as much as you can for Eid. We don't have the beautiful online shopping that we can do. But as much of that you can do before, you don't have to worry about that in Ramadan. Buy groceries as much as you can so you don't have to spend time shopping. Pre-cooked food and store it. Some husbands don't like pre-cooked food, but make sure you pre-cook at least, you know, um, a lot of the messages off of food so you don't have to do as much cooking as well. But you want to be able, generally you get the idea. And then make your home in such a way that it facilitates your Ramadan plans. I have my books, I have my salamat here, I have my alarm clock, I have my dates, I have my, you know, my TV, I just put a, a clock over it. You know, I'm not gonna have time to do that this month, except for watch Islamic videos maybe. Uh, so you're getting yourself ready, you're getting your home ready. So you're freeing up time. The second thing we need to free up is our focus. Because if you're distracted with other things, then you can't focus in Ramadan. So you have to get a medical checkup. You can't be having medical problems and health problems bothering. Try to get those organized before Ramadan um, and follow your doctor's advice. If your doctor say you can't fast, please don't fast. Right? You know, um, don't think you know more than the doctor because then you're going to put your life in danger. Fasting is not intended to put people in danger. So you practice fasting a few days prior to Ramadan. As you know, the Prophet used to, this month used to fast the most. I should have said the most he used to fast out of Ramadan was in this month. To prepare your body so that you are when you Ramadan arrives, you are ready with focus. To forgive all those who have wronged you. When that is in your mind, you can't focus. You know, you're worrying about people who wrong you. You're worried about all of that. You know, and forgive people who, who, who wronged you. And make sure you forgive others. So your heart and your mind is clear, free to focus on Allah. If you're still worrying about taking revenge on somebody and, you know, bothering yourself about those things. No. So freeing up focus and freeing up time is where it's really important that you, you first step that you want to do. So you have the intention. You got grab these two words, connect and change. That's all I'm going to be doing this month. 
and then you begin with prior to Ramadan. Now is the period I have enough free up as much time as I could. I am focused. I'm ready to focus and concentrate on Ramadan. That's step number one. Point number two. Make a rough plan for the whole month. If you want to accomplish the maximum benefit of Ramadan, you can't go in at Ramadan winging it and taking it day by day. We'll see what comes. You know, that is not the sign of a person who really wants to get the benefit. All of us know. But when you want to get the maximum benefit of something, we plan. You have a vacation, you want to get the maximum benefit, you plan it out to the great detail. When we go in Hawaii, this is where we're going to go. This is the hotel we're going to stay at. This is the kind of outing we're going to have on the first day, second day, third day, fourth day. This is what we're going to eat. You, you plan your vacation in great detail because you want to have the most benefit from it, the most entertainment, the most fun. And so anything that you, you want to get the most out of, I have to plan. Muslims go into Ramadan year after year, no plan, except I'll fast and maybe read Quran. You know, this is not a plan. So you have to have a rough plan and you should break it out into weekly plans. And I want to caution you here and say that don't be too ambitious. If you're going to be doing this for the first time, don't set goals and plans that are so ambitious that by the time the first week, you're drummed in the fact that you put down 15 items to accomplish and you accomplish two, you're going to get despondent. And you're going to begin to say, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm not having a good Ramadan. So try to be realistic and put aside realistic things each week. And why are you doing it weekly? Because you want to be able to pivot after the first week, you look at it and then you reorganize yourself. Okay, I only accomplished three out of five. Now I'll take the other two, maybe put it in the next week and be able to work week by week. So it gives you a chance to keep regrouping and remaining optimistic. So you re revise your plan. Um, the plan should be comprehensive. As I said, it shouldn't be a lot of stuff, but it should include reciting Quran, visiting the masjid, um, fasting, um, deciding what kind of good deeds you're going to do for a month and so on. So, um, so part of, of this very important thing is uh, planning for Ramadan. The third is to fast. The whole point of the month is Allah has mentioned that we should fast. And fasting is a very unique form of work. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. Which means if you don't establish the pillar of a building, then that building becomes very weak. So you want fasting to be part of our lives, fasting in Ramadan. And so unlike the other prayers like Salah, Zakah, Hajj, fasting is unique in the sense that in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, said, Kulu amal ibn Adam lah. So this hadith says, every good deed of Adam's son is for him, except fasting. Fasting, it is for me, Allah, and I shall reward it personally. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that all of our good deeds is for your, your benefit. But when you fast, it is done purely for Allah. And the reason is because it requires you to have faith. You can cheat, you can hide. You, you know, fasting is one of those things which nobody has to know. You fast, if you pray, at least somebody's seeing you praying. You're praying in Jama'ah or you're giving zakah. Somebody's betting for my money. Or you go to Hajj. It's hard to hide those worships. But fasting, you can hide it. And nobody will know whether you're fasting or not. And that is why it requires you to have the kind of iman. And Allah says, when a person, a believer does it, he's doing it for me out of sheer faith in me. And being honest and loyal with it. Even though he can get away with it. Or she can get away with it. And so Allah says, for that special moment, I will personally reward you for it. So all of us who are eligible to fast should try to fast in Ramadan.
Now, there are exceptions in the fic. If you're traveling or you're sick, then Allah doesn't want you to put you through that and so on. And generally, if you're well, fast. You should follow the, the chart of your local masjid in terms of the salah for the Ramadan. If you don't wake up one day, as the fic mentioned, then you have to continue fasting. We make our intention in the night, each night of fasting, they tend to fast tomorrow. And then if, so if you don't wake up, you have already made that intention the night before. That's why we make our intention the night before. So even if I don't wake up, my intention is already intact. You don't make one intention for the whole month. We don't have, we, we're not allowed to do that. Every night we're supposed to make the intention for the next day. And so whether you wake up or not, you can't say, oh, I wake up late. I didn't eat anything. So I can't fast. No. Suhoor is not compulsory. If you didn't meet your suhoor, consider you have at air and you have to continue fasting. Now, we should learn some of the basic rules of fasting so you don't break the fast without knowing. I have that ebook which I had done specifically for this, um, 101 um, Ramadan, 101 for busy Muslims, um, which uh, Riyadh can make them available for you. Um, I think it, we normally put it on the Noor Islam website. So um, if, if you need it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's available. It's a free ebook and it gives you all the basic rules of fasting and zakah and all of that. Now, there are many benefits when you fast. And one of, despite the fact that Allah asks us to fast, we just fast because Allah said fast. But we have also discovered that Allah gives many incentives to the people who fast. One, he forgives the sins of, of people who fast. Man sama Ramadan, imanan, wahtisaban, ghufir lahu ma taqaddama min zambu. Whoever fast, seeking, connecting, trying to, to, to get to the mercy of Allah, Allah says, I'll forgive your past sins. Devils are chained, so they don't bother you. Gates of heaven are open. Gates of hell are closed. Allah frees every night, comes down and frees and, and, and forgives people. If some of his servants, each night of Ramadan, Allah answers your dua when you're fasting at the time of breaking the iftar. You know, you make dua just five minutes before you break your fast. The dua there is very important and accepted. Instead of all talking, Take a two, few moments to make dua. Allah rewards them, multiplies the rewards of fasting. Um, the fasting person will be will experience one of the greatest joys. There are two greatest joys that you will have. One of it is when you break your fast. There's a special feeling when you break your fast. When I fasted the whole day and I bask in the glory that I've obeyed my Lord the whole day. And then you go to break your fast and you're taking that first date or sip of water. There's something that moves through you of joy that is hard to describe to the, for the believers to, to, to describe it. And so the other is to meet your Lord. And then Allah has placed Laylatul Qadr, night which is equivalent to a thousand months. So inside of this month, in order to incentivize it for us, Allah has put many things. We also know the medical benefits of fasting, which is a long list of things. So that's the second thing, fasting Ramadan. Number three, we got to move faster now. We have to try to attend the masjid during Ramadan. Those of you who are able to, there is nothing like that brings the feeling and the, 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 the joy of Ramadan, like when you go to that masjid. You know, if you try to enjoy Ramadan from home, and those of you who saw what we did in COVID, how was your 2020 Ramadan? Everybody was at home. You know, it was not the same. When you go to the masjid each night, you know, um, and you interact with your fellow believers, you break the fast with others. You meet people who are fasting just like you. A lot of them as you know, offer dinner. So you go to you break your fast and you have dinner as well. We get to meet our brothers and sisters. We get to hear their stories and also recognize that not only we alone are going through struggles and hardship, we get to hear people share theirs as well. So we don't feel so alone in our struggle to try to you know, navigate our life. When you attend a masjid, 
it is a sign that Allah has invited you. You see, this is the house of Allah. And Allah, like every one of us, people can't come to your house unless you get invited. Or else they will, it's like a thief coming in your house. So most of the people coming into our house, they come by personal invitation. So when you see you have the inclination and you appear at the house of Allah, it is a sign that Allah has invited you. And what a great honor it is to feel that Allah has invited me to his house in Ramadan. When you don't show up, that means you were not invited by Allah. Something went awry in your heart. You made some excuse. You found some way of nav circumnavigate, you know, getting, rid getting out of that desire to go there. So you were not invited. Just like Hajj. Allah has to invite you. So that is a sign of Allah inviting you to his house. Why you go there? To connect to Allah. The best place to connect to Allah is in his house. You go there, Allah is there. Allah is telling you, come to my house. Connect with me. What we are doing in Ramadan? Connecting and changing. And it is a sign of your love for Allah. That you have gone over and above to connect and to show your love for Allah. When we enter a masjid, what do we say? Allahumma ftahli abwaaba rahmatik. Oh Allah, open for me the doors of your mercy. That's how we enter the masjid. You know, I wish you make this small door. Oh Allah, open the doors of your mercy. What are you going to get there? Mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the masjid, we come to talk to Allah. You can connect to him, ask forgiveness, to pray to him, to make salah. To put our highest part of our body to the lowest part of the ground as a sign of our humility and gratitude to Allah. The message is a place where we can focus and we can sit in a corner and we can really contemplate on our existence, our connection, our life. So when you come to the Allah's masjid, you will experience Ramadan on a different level. Stay at home, it's not the same. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَ الزَّكَاةِ وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَعَسَى أُولَٰئِكَ أَنْ يَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُخْتَدِينَ That the mosques, the masjids of Allah, are only to be maintained by those who believe in Allah on the last day. And to establish prayer and zakah. And do not fear anyone except Allah. For it is expected that those will be the rightly guided. So Allah is telling us the people. And the word ya'muru here is a very beautiful word in the Arabic. Here it's translated as maintain. It actually has many meanings. One, to make sure the masjid continues to function professionally. To make sure the masjid is beautified. So it has many connotations to this world. And Allah is testifying that truly the people who keep this masjid open and alive are people who believe in Allah and Allah. So Allah is testifying that those who connect to the masjid, that they are believers, they establish the prayer, they pay zakah, and they don't fear anybody except Allah. And Allah says he will give them guidance. So make sure during Ramadan, we visit the masjid as much as possible. Lastly, I want to say that try to visit many masjids. Don't just go to one masjid. If you have the ability to visit different, different masjids, you will meet more different kinds of believers. So, you know, try to, to move around if you can, because it will enhance the experience even more. The fifth is Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he introduced Ramadan, he talks about the Quran. Shahr Ramadan al-Ladhi unzila fi al-Quran. Ramadan is the month in which we have revealed the Quran. So the Quran is deeply connected to Ramadan. In fact, if you understand what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel. Here is the Lord of the worlds, the universe and everything in between. Is going to connect to the lowly human being. The, the, the insignificant human being on this small dot we call Earth. 
What a, a monumentous occasion. So Allah sends Jibreel to connect and to give guidance, to bring guidance to humanity with Jibreel when the first revelation. And Allah wanted to make sure that that occasion is never forgotten because it's so magnificent. So what did Allah wrap around it? He says, okay, this night is so special. I'm going to, it's called Laylatul Qadr. I'm going to reward you a thousand months. Would that get your attention to remember that night? Sure it would. Allah says, I'm going to wrap around it to have you fast a whole month in which this Quran was revealed. Would you remember it? Yeah. You know, so Allah has wrapped around this incident of this first revelation, all of these so that you and I will never ever forget. This was one of the greatest moments humanity have ever experienced in their whole history. This bringing to, of the last and final revelation to humanity. And Allah says in the Quran, in the al Quran, Yahdi lilati akum, wa yabashiru minila ladina yamaluna salihati and nalahum ezran kabira. That this Quran guides to that which is straight and upright and brings good news to the believers who do righteous deeds. That there is a great reward in store for them. So during Ramadan, you want to have as part of your plan that you're going to put down this rough monthly plan and weekly plan. And I'm recommending to you that at least 15 minutes a day, you should recite the Quran in Arabic if you're able to. If you're very fluent, you should recite usually a one juz takes about between four to five minutes to uh, an hour. Right? Some people do it less, but generally it's around that time. But if you are a very weak beginner and you don't, you know, Arabic is very hard for you, try to do 15 minutes of, you know, battling that Arabic. And then spend 15 minutes to understand the meaning of it, of whatever you have read. If you finish a juz, you should also spend another half an hour reading the English of that juz so that you can benefit both in terms of the, the blessings of reading the Arabic, but also educating yourself and connecting yourself properly with what the Quran means. There are many benefits that accrue from reciting the Quran, especially in Ramadan. The Quran will make intercession for you, many things. So the Prophet Sallallahu have many a hadith. The best of you are the ones who learn the Quran and teach it to others. He mentioned, Whoever reads a letter from the book of Allah, he will have a reward. For those of you who have been into my Arabic um, recitation course, pick up the Quran. And even if you can recognize and call a letter, ma, ba, he says, whoever recites a letter from the book of Allah, then he will receive one good deed as 10 good deeds like it. So for every letter, you get 10 blessings. And he's saying, I'm not saying Alif, Lam, Mim is one, is, is, is one letter. Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, Mim is a letter. So you get third of blessings. So if you battle for 15 minutes, try to recognize something on the page, Allah will give you this reward. The Prophet Sallallahu said, read the Quran for verily it will stand as an intercessor for its companions will to speak on behalf of you. Aisha said, you know, that verily the one who recites the Quran beautifully, smoothly and precisely, he will be, he or she will be in the company of the noble, obedient angels. And as for the one who recites and have very great difficulty to do it, stammering or stumbling through the verses, they will get a double reward. How merciful is Allah? And this is Bukhari and Muslim with the highest level of hadith. Right? So if it's hard for you and still you persevere, you're still trying with it, you're still picking it up every day in Ramadan, trying to stumble through it, stammer through it. Allah will not allow it to go unnoticed or unrewarded. He may gift you with the ability to recite it fluently, inshallah. 
So Quran has to be on our agenda if you want to have a beneficial Ramadan. Every day, got to pick it up, read a little bit from it. All right? Don't be just a person who just fasts and that's it. I think that that's the end of it. Make sure you schedule this um, every day. The sixth suggestion we have of how to make a Ramadan is a zakah. You know, we can calculate our zakah. It's a yearly calculation. So you could do it at the end of the year. You could do January. You know, you could do it when you're finishing your year, December. Most Muslims, what we do, we do it Ramadan to Ramadan. And the reason why we do it like that is because we get the most blessings in Ramadan. So we want to be able to do the most good deeds we can in Ramadan. So all of us, a lot of us, the smart thing is, Calculate and distribute your zakah to Ramadan. And properly calculate it. Don't, there's no room or there's no excuse for not properly understanding how to calculate your zakah. There's a lot of software available. There's a lot of forms available. You can consult your local imams and the masjid to help you with that, you know, so that you make sure that you are calculating it properly and that you are distributing it properly. There are eight, eight heads of expenditure and so on. So make sure that you are going to do your zakah in Ramadan. And uh, a lot of people, they try to pay it in the first two weeks of Ramadan. But you can also, because sometimes uh, you have to weigh this very, very, you know, maybe pay some um, distributed throughout the month so you get more blessing for it. But make sure that you, you do your zakah in Ramadan. Number seven is there are three things that you must be engaged in. This is how we're going to connect to Allah and have Allah in our lives. Number one, and it's also all of these things in Ramadan is developing habits, new habits for us, because all of them are difficult. For many of us, we don't recite Quran every day. So if you begin the Ramadan for one month, I'm reading it every day. After Ramadan, why have I stopped? Why will I stop? Why am I not going to continue reading it every day? I still need that blessing. I still need that Quran. So the idea is that the habits that you're going to develop in Ramadan, you don't stop after Ramadan. Continue. During Ramadan, you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness because this is the month of forgiveness. This is the month when Allah is going to forgive you the most. Doesn't mean you stop after Ramadan. You're going to develop this habit and change and become a person who asks Allah for forgiveness every night. Every night before you sleep, you ask Allah to forgive you for anything you may have done. And you keep that habit. The Ramadan, you'll be making a lot of dua, asking Allah. Because that's when Allah is answering the dua. A dua who will ibadah. Dua is worship. And so when you ask from Allah, He promised the answer. You're going to keep that habit after Ramadan. It is a month of zikr. So, Ya Ladira Aman Uskurul Kurullah Zikran Kasira. That, you know, that all you who believe remember Allah with much remembrance. You know, Kasir means like a lot. So, this is a, a month in which we will try to make the zikr. You know, after the salah, you do Subhanallah, 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 33 times, Alhamdulillah, 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 33 times. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, 34 times. Um, it takes about, what, a minute or two. Even if you are so busy, at least do 10, 10, 10. If you're extra busy, but try to make that zikr. But a few moments, those things have implications. They affect your scale. And so these three things of every day in Ramadan, ask Allah to forgive you, make it dua and having zikr, will serve to create in you this attitude of connecting to Allah. One, when you seek forgiveness, it means I'm being mindful of the wrong I may have done. And that alone helps me to do less wrong the next day and less wrong the next day. The dua makes me very calm and less stressed. As problems come to me, I tell myself I'm making dua to Allah. I am transferring these problems for Allah to handle on behalf of me. You know, so now you, you have this sense of confidence. Allah is handling my problem. I've, I've, I've asked him to work on it. So it, it, it makes you less stressful. You know, and then using the month, 
when you glorify the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we learned in other hadith, it, it brings calmness. It brings serenity to your heart. When you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make zikr towards The eighth thing that we can do in Ramadan is make sure that we are proactively preparing for and pursuing the last 10 nights of Ramadan specifically the odd nights. But the last 10 nights is when the Laylatul Qadr, this special night of a thousand blessings occur. As mentioned in Surah Al-Qadr, in Zalnahu Fi Laylatul Qadr, we've sent it down in the night of Qadr. And so you want to be able to build up to being able to proactively seek out. And what do you do? There are no specific rituals that you have to do in the night of Laylatul Qadr. You will hear a lot of people, will, you will read books and they will say, well, you need to make a hundred kulhu and 50, you know, Duru Sharif and all of that. There is no set specific ibadah. So what you want to do during the night of Laylatul Qadr is to just, you're doing something extra to show that you're searching for that night. And you vary it up. So you say, for example, I'm going to pray two extra rakas, lat al nafil. I'm going to make an extra dua. I'm going to recite the Quran for five minutes. In other words, there's a couple of different things you do, and I'm going to sit and act, make dua to Allah. Um, so on these nights, you're making some extra prayers, um, and then you are doing some extra, even sitting, reciting the Quran, contemplating it. All these are acts of ibadah that you can do on night of And so, don't just go to sleep as usual or treat the other nights of Ramadan the same way. Nights of Laylatul Qadr, it means you have to exert yourself. Show Allah that you're doing something extra. I'm going to wake up an extra hour and do several different kinds of impact. can even be reading an Islamic book, gaining knowledge. So, but what I'm doing is I'm making sure that my Laylatul Qadr night, I'm not treating it the same way that I treated the rest of Ramadan. I'm doing something more. So that Allah can see I'm proactively pursuing, trying to get that night and make it dua. And so um, make sure that you, if you can go to the masjid and do it, that's even better. Number nine, <clears throat> making a thakaf. This is seclusion. The Prophet used to spend the last 10 days in the masjid, secluded, didn't go anywhere. This is not a practical thing for a lot of us, right? To be able to, to do because we have jobs and we may not have gotten time off. If you are able to get vacation days off for those last 10 days, that's the best thing to do, take the vacation. So you could be as much available. If you can't do 10 days, try to do a weekend, go to the masjid. There will always be people in the masjid who is making it to camp. So you can go spend Friday night, spend the whole day Saturday, Saturday night, come home Sunday. You know, so you can spend some time uh, with the etikaf. Because this, if you have done etikaf before, you will get to recognize it's one of the most amazing experience that one can have. You know, because you're there, literally your light is reduced to such simplicity that you begin to ask, how come I needed all this stuff? Because all you're doing in a mission, what do you need? Some food in the morning, some food at night. A bathroom, place to rest my head. You know, that's it. Your whole life in 10 days is condensed to these essentials. Just need a place to, to eat uh, some food in the morning, some food in the night. I just need a place to, to go to the bathroom and rest my head. And all the millions of paraphernalia that we are accustomed to having, video games and TV and this and that and out of, you get to realize, all these things, look, I can do without them. I can live without them. It detaches you from the dunya in a very profound way. For those who have done it, calf, it is absolutely incredible. You get to realize how simple Allah has made the world for us to live in and how complicated we have made it for ourselves. You have to have all these creams and lotions and potions and all these different kinds of clothing and all these different kinds of foods and all these different kinds... We've made our life so complicated and complex that we find it difficult to even keep up. 
it's become so expensive as well. When you're in a takaf, it's like, wow, can't believe, you know. And then the confining into the masjid, you also get to feel how free you are. Because after Ramadan, when you go out, you get to recognize, wow, I have the ability to move around. You feel very confined. It's like you're in jail for uh, 10 days. And you get to recognize the bounty of being free. The choices that you have, that you can appreciate that there's so many things. I made it to calf with my son, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to do that. And I wrote down almost 80 things during that time of how I was affected by this experience. Especially with, with my son, my big son with me there. You know, and I hope that maybe one day I can publish, you know, of what it feels like to experience it. So for the women, they do it at home. So you can lock yourself in a room and you can do that for a day or two. You have to get the cooperation of your spouses. But for the women, you can do this as well. So it's not just exclusively for men. And if there's facilities that are messed with, women can do it there too. That's also allowed. But generally, women would do it in their homes. Um, and you get to really introspect and analyze, and it's a truly a wonderful thing. There's a lot of weak hadith about the benefits of etikaf. Please avoid quoting some of these because a lot of them, almost all of them, are weak hadith. So you hear if you do etikaf, all of this will happen to you. Know, you know, these are weak hadith. So we don't quote any hadith about this. Prophet Sallallahu did it, recommended it for us. Number 10 is Ramadan is a time when Allah giving you sometimes 77 times more blessing for all the good deeds. And so you want to be able to, during this month, do as much good deeds as you can. Khairun nas and fa'ahum lin nas. The best of people are those who benefit humanity the most. And so the Muslim is like an energizer bunny, always looking to find a way to spread goodness, to share love, and generosity, and helping people. So if you can volunteer to help, you know what is a great honor it is? To volunteer to help feed other people who are fasting. You get the blessings of their fast as well. So you want to be proactive. It does not looking after me, me, me. You want to be able to share if you're strong and young, you know, share that. Become fasting helps us to become more aware of the suffering of the needy. We are depriving ourselves of food for one month. These people are doing it for their lives every day. We get to appreciate and have empathy for them and reach out to help them. You know, so it, it provides and helps us become a person who don't postpone good deeds, who actually find joy. There's a special joy that comes when you do something good for a person, you know, that, that you cannot really explain that when you help an next fellow human being who needs it, Allah places in your heart an incredible sense of fulfillment and joy. And that all the research has shown that the people who do that, their lives become prolonged, you know, because they live a better quality life as a result. So we need to measure the success of each day by how much quality and quantity good deeds that we do. That's how you know if you're successful. How much good deeds did I do today? Were they good? You know, that's why even our neighbors, we ask when we give them fruits, to give them the best part of our fruit, not the rotten ones. Usually people give away food, they give away the ones that are not good. We're supposed to give away from the ones that are the best and keep the rotten ones for ourselves. So we need to be hasan, be nice to people, forgive those who have wronged you, give them second and third chance to make it up. We all need second and third chances in our lives when we mess up. Why not extend that to others instead of dismissing them? You had your chance, buddy. You know, I'm not forgiving you and I'm not giving you another chance. Don't do that. Be a person like Allah is a tawab. He forgives you over and over and over. We must do the same. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this Ramadan of ours that is coming. And hopefully, if we understand that we are connecting and changing, and we focus on why we are trying to do this, and, and incorporate some of these things in our lives during this month, and hopefully they remain after Ramadan, then we will become transformed in a very great way and become the kind of believer that Allah will be proud of 
and that we will feel a sense of fulfillment for ourselves, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.